Hi guys. All right. We are going to do our Russian Revolution video. You need to watch this, take notes, um, get some information. You can watch it more than once if you need. Basically, what we're going to do is go through the PowerPoint. I'll talk to you. I'll narrate. Um, write down any questions that you have, and then we will go over it when we get back into class. So here we go. I'm going to put the PowerPoint on, and we're going to start right here with the Russian Revolution. <coughs> so. As you guys know, in World War I, Russia had to step out because of the Russian Revolution. They had to end their involvement in World War I. So what we're going to talk about is what was going on in Russia that actually caused that to happen. So to do that, we have to understand a little bit about who was in charge of Russia. Um, and we have to go back a little bit before World War I. We have to go back to 1881. If you look, a guy named Alexander III became the Tsar of Russia. Now, the Tsar is just the fancy word for an absolute monarch. So that meant that he had complete and total power. Um, he inherited his power. So the Tsars would go down a line. When one Tsar died, that Tsar's son or close relative would then become the next Tsar. So Alexander III in 1881 was the Tsar of Russia, absolute, complete, total ruler. And he started something called autocratic rule. So in autocratic rule, it means that you throw the hammer down on everybody. You get rid of any opposition, any dissent, anything that questions your power, anybody who goes against you. And he did this by doing things like, hold on, let me hit the next one. Right there. Whoops, went back to me, sorry. Hold on, there we go. Nope, still not there. Yep, right there. Work with me guys, sorry, 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 okay. So he did autocratic rule. So he did things such as he would censor if you wrote anything, um, if you were writing a newspaper article, if you're writing anything that questioned him, he would censor it, take it away, put it away. Uh, he had secret police, even in school. So you'd be saying, I mean, imagine you were sitting in your classroom and you don't know if anyone around you might be a spy, might be listening, might tell the czar or tell the police of the czar if you happen to say, you know, I think the czar is dumb or I don't agree with what the czar did and you would get a knock on your door in the middle of the night and the czar's secret police would step in, take you out and you'd probably never be heard from again. And so that's kind of what they were living with. Also, people who were not Russian, who were living in Russia, were just treated horribly. They were seen as second-class citizens, not as good as everybody else. So it was not a great place to be living. So. When Alexander III died, his son Nicholas II became Tsar. And he became Tsar in 1894. And he basically didn't do anything different. They were hoping that maybe he would be less autocratic, that he would be a little bit nicer and not rule so harshly. But he was still very autocratic. So he continued doing what he had been doing. At the same time, Russia was industrializing and so they industrialized fast. So the rest of the world, you know, we've learned about the Industrial Revolution, the rest of the world had industrialized, Europe had industrialized, America had industrialized, but Russia was kind of slow to get to it. But when it did, it went super fast. So Nicholas really wanted them to industrialize. He wanted Russia to be as great as the industrialized countries. And so he tried to do it super, super fast. But when he did it super fast, the same stuff that happened in Europe happened. You had poverty, you had pollution, you had horrible working conditions. And so life really was bad for the working class Russians and it happened super fast. So just like in the other countries, the people were mad, the people were upset. And what you have is a whole group of people who are angry, they feel like they're not being treated well, they feel like their lives are not appreciated by the person who rules them, and they start to want to do something about it. And some of the people who felt this way were called the Bolsheviks. And you see it up there, it's B-O-L-S-H-E-V-I-K-S. It's pronounced Bolshevik. And basically they were revolutionaries. They were people who were calling for change. And so much so, some of them are even calling for the end of the czar, saying that we need to take out, just like Locke said, John Locke, remember him? Let's have a Dora moment. Do you remember John Locke? Think about him. Who was he? 
If you guessed he was the guy that wanted people to overthrow bad governments, you're right if your rights are not being protected. So Lenin, who's in the middle there, agreed that if people's rights were not being protected, that you needed to change your government. And so that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to try to force a better, more equal, more fair government. And so his group was called the Bolsheviks. At the same time this was going on, something called Bloody Sunday happened, and this was in 1905. And basically what you had were 200,000 workers that decided that they were fed up. They had had enough of it. They, they wanted better working conditions. They wanted to be treated better, and so they went on strike. Does anyone know what a strike is? All right, if you said a strike is when people refuse to work and they stand out and march for better conditions, you were right. So they strike, and they strike in front of the Tsar's palace. So there's 200,000 angry workers in front of the Tsar's palace, which you can see in the back of the picture there. And basically what Nicholas does is he doesn't really think much of it. He sees them as being really annoying, and he sees them as not being able, you know, he ignores what they're asking for, and he ignores their pleas. And what he actually does is he asks his army, he, he orders his army to fire on them, and they do. And it kills a bunch of the people. If you look at the bottom of the picture there, there's the army. You can see them holding guns, and they just straight up open fire on all of those strikers. Nicholas knows that this is kind of a turning point. He knows, wow, if my people have stood up and done this, then I must be doing something very, very wrong. I need to change. I need to do something different, or this is just going to keep on happening. But he doesn't do anything about it right then. So first major thing you have happening is these angry, upset workers who are starting to strike out against the Tsar. Then you have this lady, okay? This is Alexandria. This is Nicholas's wife, and she's called the Tsarina. He's the Tsar, so she's the Tsarina. And she is super, super religious, super religious. She is something called Eastern Orthodox, which is a religion that is similar to Catholicism, like we learned about with Europe. Um, it has some differences, but anyway, she was very, very religious. And the reason that this is important, we have to look at a couple things. First, this is the son of Nicholas and Alexander. His name is Alexei Romanov. Oh, I forgot to tell you at the beginning. Romanov is their last name. So all of the czars, their last name is Romanov. They're known as the Romanovs. And the thing about Alexei, who you can see in the picture here, is that he had something called hemophilia. Uh, have you ever heard of hemophilia? If you read this and said it's a blood disease, you're right. So basically hemophilia, your blood doesn't clot. So, you know, when you get a, you fall, you get a scab. He didn't get a scab. He would just keep bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. And if he fell, he might not get a scrape and bleed on the outside, but he might be bleeding internally and he could die. And he was the only son of Nicholas and Alexander. So he was supposed to be the next czar. So he was seen as being very, very important. And he was Alexander's baby and he was sick. So she was pretty much willing to do or believe anything or anyone that she felt could help Alexei and make sure that he, you know, didn't die of this blood disease. Okay, are you ready for this next one? And... Boo! Look at this guy. All right. What do you think of him? His name is Rasputin. And what he was, Rasputin was this holy man. And basically, he came along and he convinced Alexandria that he could save Alexei. See a picture right here. He says he can cure Alexei, and therefore, Alexandria pretty much does whatever he says. But in doing this, she starts giving him more and more power. She starts doing what he says. She starts um, kind of letting him run things. And this is important because we're going to notice that during, let's move ahead for a second. Whoops, I went the wrong way. All right. World War I, Russia was part of it. And as we know, millions, you know, hundreds of thousands of Russians were dying. 1.7 million Russians ended up dying. Well, Nicholas, trying to show that he cares about the people, decides to go to the front lines on the Eastern Front, and he goes to fight. So he leaves Russia, he leaves the center of Russia, he leaves the capital, and he leaves Alexandria in charge. 
So he's far away. He doesn't have any control or any connection over what's going on. And he leaves Alexandria in charge. Now, first off, this upset the Russian people because there's all this stuff going on at home. There's all these strikes, and he just leaves. He just goes. And so they're really upset about this because they feel like he's abandoning them. Then you have Alexandria in charge, which brings us back to Rasputin. So because she's letting him have more and more political power, the people start getting really angry, especially the nobles. And remember, they're the people with money who have some power. And so the nobles start to get worried that Rasputin is actually doing everything, that he's making the decisions, and that he's actually running the country. And they're like, what is this crazy man doing running the country? So they come up with a plan, and they decide they're going to kill him, which is fine. Kill him, whatever. But the interesting thing about Rasputin, this is just kind of a whole side story. So they come up with this plan. They're going to um, lure him in, and they're going to poison him. And they decide that's how they're going to kill him. So they go and they poison him, but Rasputin doesn't die. So they then proceed to stab him, but Rasputin doesn't die. Then they shoot him, but Rasputin still doesn't die. So he's been poisoned, shot, and stabbed. They then throw him into the river, this frozen river, to take him out. And he finally dies. So they kept trying to kill him, couldn't do it. There's a lot of myths saying he was the man that couldn't die. But they did eventually take him out. So they kill Rasputin in response to the power he has. So, summing up what we've talked about so far, you have a lot of soldiers that are dying over in World War I, making the people ha angry. You have the Tsar, who's not around to really take care of anything, so the people feel abandoned. You have this nutty Tsarina, who is just running around doing whatever this crazy, horrible, this crazy uh, holy man says. You've got awful working conditions. You've got angry workers. So the only solution is it's time for a revolution. Things have to change. And you've got Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks ready to make that happen. And what you then have is something called the March Revolution. And basically, in the March Revolution, in 1917, these strikes that have been going on got bigger and got worse and got more extreme. And what changed is that the soldiers, who way back at the beginning we said had fired on the workers, well, this strike, this series of strikes, the soldiers stopped. They said they started to agree with the people and they refused to fire on the workers. So basically the Tsar lost his army. And we've said all year about, you know, the way you have the power is to have the military. The military is what gives you that power. So the Tsar lost the power of the military. And at this point, he knew that he had lost what he had. And so basically the protest turned into an uprising. And the Tsar had to abdicate. Abdicate means to step down, to give up your power. So the Tsar steps down, he's arrested, his whole family is arrested, and they are imprisoned, and a group of people called the Soviets start to control the cities. So these Soviets are the, the revolutionaries who were pushing for change, and they are the ones that rose up and took down the Tsar. What ends up happening is that the Bolsheviks, the Soviets, Soviets were some of the Bolsheviks, they signed that treaty we talked about with Germany that pulled Russia out of World War I, that Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. So Russia is now pulling out of the war because they have to deal with putting their country back together and having, you know, figuring out who's going to be in charge, what kind of government they're going to have. And they finalize taking over the government by executing the Tsar and his family. So you can see right there, there's the Tsar. He had four daughters, then his wife, and then little Alexei. Now, if you've ever heard of Anastasia, I know there's a movie, Anastasia, that's about one of the Tsar's daughters. Um, there's a rumor, a legend, that when the Tsar's family was executed, that somehow she got away and was not, and went off to live in Europe and lived out her days um, as this Russian princess who, you know, never returned to Russia. So the Tsar was executed, and what you have is Vladimir Lenin restores order. 
He renames the country the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, known as the USSR, and they adopt communism as their system, their economic system, and their system of government. So this revolution, you have this shift from being the czar, having the czar be in complete power, to now having a communist Soviet Socialist Republic. And so that is the history of the Revol Russian Revolution, what led up to it, and what ended it. And we will discuss this when we get to class. So if you have any questions, write them down, take notes. When we get to class, we'll talk about it. I'll be asking you different questions, who different people are, um, why different things happen. So be ready. Uh, if you have questions ahead of time, you can post them in the comment part of the blog, and I will try to um, post answers to it. I will check on it. And that's about it. Hope you enjoyed, and I will see you guys in class.